Thank you everybody for joining us uh, today for the uh, ARIS webinar. Um, uh, I'm really excited about talking to you about this um, uh, experiment because uh, it was a, a completely new experience for me and for many of my collaborators in the uh, ENAM uh, seismic experiment team. And uh, before I, uh, I, I move on to uh, the presentation, I want to actually mention the uh, ENAM, which stands for Eastern North America Margin uh, um, Team. And uh, it, so this is actually by no means my own um, effort. It was a very much concerted effort um, by uh, the lead PI of the um, experiment, which was uh, Harm Van Avendong at UT Austin, and, uh, and then Donna Shillington at Lamont, Margaret Benoit, and then Brandon uh, Dagan, uh, Jim Garty, Matt Hornbeck here at SMU, Dan Lizeraldi, uh, Maureen Long, Steve Harder, and Vassell, and Gail Christensen. So all these people uh, took part in writing the proposal together and then went to the field to acquire the, the data that I'm going to uh, present today and also to uh, bring together the community around this uh, relatively new type of um, experiment, which is a, uh, exactly a community experiment. So, um, so what I'd like to do today is, um, since we, uh, we just pulled out the stations, the last stations this summer in July, I'd like to illustrate how we went about um, uh, coming up with the, conceiving the idea of building a community experiment uh, in the ENAM site through implementing the, uh, let's say, the, the vision of the community in this site through uh, acquiring the data and then uh, releasing the data to the community. How did we go about it and, um, and, and what happened? And, you know, and, and hopefully this will be a guide for, you know, if there is anybody in the audience that wants to do the same somewhere else, you know, this represents an example of how you can bring together the community you know, to do the same. So uh, let's move on and let's see. Uh, so we are, we are going to oops, let's see. Let's see if I can move on. Okay, yes. Yeah, so we're going to focus in this area. This is the um, the focus site, the portion of the focus site along the east coast uh, is uh, North American margin that we uh, chose to focus. And uh, before we actually focus on the science, let's see what is what makes a community experiment. This is a, a relatively new type of experiment, like I mentioned, and we've seen several examples in the last uh, 10 years. And as far as I, you know, I've seen, each of these community experiments is a, is a different, uh, has been implemented differently by uh, the community. And they, they range in scales and in scope. So, uh, from the GeoPRISM implementation plan, you know, what define a community experiment is actually an experiment that is planned and executed by the community instead of being planned and executed by one PI or one, you know, small group of, you know, PIs. And so um, that is the first big uh, change in, 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 in the way these community experiments are, are um, uh, executed. Uh, in, in addition, it actually is, you know, a, a community experiment plans to acquire a large geophysical data set that goes beyond what is usually the uh, scope of a small group or one, one single or a group uh, uh, of PIs. And, uh, and maybe one, uh, what the main difference between a normal uh, PI-driven proposal and a community-driven uh, proposal is that the data becomes available upon acquisition, you know, uh, right after QC, being QC'd. And so there is uh, no need or there is uh, the, the, the two-year embargo that usually is imposed to a normal PI-driven acquisition is foregoed and, uh, and, and the data becomes available immediately. So this approach is actually, uh, the approach enables a much larger group of people to uh, benefit quickly from the data and the use of the data by a broader community, maximizing in a way their scientific impact. So that is actually the goal of a 
community experiment. So in, in addition, there is this involvement uh, and training of junior scientists and students that is uh, enhanced with respect to what is capable or what is possible through a, a normal PI-driven proposal. And so that's why, for example, because it, so it's a, it's a mostly a, 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 a an experiment that is mostly driven by the community and uh, it's uh, the goal of which is to acquire a data a data set that is then used by the community for for science purposes and education purposes and so for example in in our uh, community experiment we did not propose to analyze the data beyond basic uh, data reductions and so what, why did we choose the, uh, the uh, east, east coast of the uh, North American margin? So there were actually, uh, there was a synergy, uh, an almost a unique type of synergy between a convergence in time of several, uh, uh, of several um, elements that came together. And the first one was that GeoPRISM uh, selected as the focus site um, the East Coast, the East North American margin, as part of their um, um, uh, in, uh, rift initiation and evolution, and together with the um, with the um, um, with the um, African rift, and so as part of that, you know, it became uh, clear that there was a need to gather active source and broadband seismic data. Uh, in, in the same portion of Inam to link all the geologic processes. At the same time, uh, during um, at the Lehigh um, workshop, implementation workshop, um, which was co-sponsored by Geoprism and, and Earthscope, it was uh, clear that this coincidence of the arrival of the Earthscope transportable array to the East Coast was providing uh, a synergy between the research effort of these two groups. And so there was a unanimous sentiment at the meeting that it was important to make a special effort to maximize the, the potential uh, between these two efforts. In addition, there was uh, the USGS plans to acquire multi-channel and OBS data beyond the 200 uh, nautical miles from the coast to fulfill the requirements of the Article 76 of the UN Conventional on the Law of the Sea to um, um, define the U.S. continental shelf and maritime uh, zone. And so that was also an additional effort that was going to be uh, taking place in the same location uh, that, that uh, enhanced the, um, the reason why we wanted to do this. And also an, an increased interest from the energy companies and also an additional need from perceived from the science community that we needed to grow and strengthen the seismological community that uh, you know to go in the field and and build it from from the base a community that will oriented rather than lab oriented and so that's why uh, we felt that um, there was a, this uh, uh, impulse from the community from the base to just uh, uh, drive uh, the attention in this in in this location and there were actually in the geoprism um, they were already spelled out many of the uh, objectives, scientific objectives, to focus on uh, in these locations. And many of them were, you know, generic in, 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 in the sense that we wanted to know what controls the architecture of rift and margin in general, you know, both during and after the, the breakup. And, you know, and these are just, this is just a list that you can find in the GeoPRISM implementation plan. And I'm not going to read them all, but, you know, many of them are associated with the inheritance of the structure, how the, you know, how the processes that drive rifting interact and evolve and lead to the uh, final rifting, rifted margin arch architecture, how the magmatism and the rift structure vary depending on the segment along the rift, and, the, and then how, you know, eventually the rift evolves through time and, you know, eventually how it evolves, you know, uh, even today. And of course, the, you know, I'm 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 not even spending too much because we'll be here all afternoon. But you know, one of the inheritance, uh, one of the many um, inheritance um, uh, observations that has that have been made, for example, is this onshore strong transition in the structure of the Appalachian origin, you know, between the southern and the uh, northern Appalachian, that corresponds, you know, on that, that we observe on land, that corresponds offshore in a different in in the 
um, elastic thickness of the lithosphere, which is reflected in the just position, so just like position of strong and weak blocks, and in this segmentation that you know still play a role in controlling the amount of sediments deposited offshore, and the sediments deposited offshore are offshore are are seen has you know a difference in eight kilometers to the south and 15 kilometers to the north. So still this this differentiation offshore still seems to be a reflection of the inheritance of the structure that we observe onshore. And then of course you know the margin has been uh, we call it a passive margin, but there is a, an increasing awareness that the enum hosts a, a range of active processes, and obviously uh, all these processes like landslide and triggering of landslide that can be triggered by uh, uh, earthquakes or depositional processes like uh, hydrate you know, dissociation, all this uh, uh, margin is actually still very active. And, uh, and and this activity, both you know, land, um, landslide and, and 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 earthquakes, can have a substantial impact on this coastal region that are densely um, uh, populated. So there was actually a a sense from the community that this was a site that could uh, be investigated in 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 un, under many scale and. Uh, uh, both in terms in terms of uh, temporal scale and spatial scales, and so in order to understand the role of the inheritance and magmatis both in the uh, rifting and in the rupture of the um, uh, of the continent, and also to understand the evolution of of the of the rifting process, and also to understand the surface processes, there was a need, which was actually the, the science goals from for, for uh, uh, East North America margin community experiment, there was a, a recognized he, a need to uh, make observation that would extend from the Paleozoic Appalachian terrains all the way through the continent ocean transition and onto the um, ancient, ancient uh, oceanic lithosphere. So that's something that will span the entire mature passive margin, and then across this expanse, we needed to we realized we needed to go from the crust well into the mantle. And as we did this, we needed to go, you know, achieving this goal to if we wanted to understand the roles of inheritance, the magmatis, the 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 recent evolution of the rifting and the active processes, we needed to make observation that will span large spatial and temporal scales and that all these observations needed to be co-located. Now obviously if we wanted to do this, this is, these are the, you know, these are observations that go at, at a scale and you know, multi-scale, multi-resolution that go beyond the ability of a single PI driven proposal uh, uh, effort. And so this is actually one of the main goal, one of the main reason why we um, came together and we, uh, as a community, to support a, a community uh, experiment. And so the ultimate uh, expected outcome is a, a suite of integrated images. You know, a multi, as I said, multi-resolution that image uh, the, the sediments, the sedimentary processes, and the crustal processes, and then the mantle seismic structure, so that we can link the deformation at the surface, in the crust, and at depth, you know, so that we can link everything from the surface into the mantle, and so that we can actually understand the the uh, all the the integrated portrait of this crustal and mantle lithosphere and how they they they, they interact together. So. We, uh, you know, and this is an image that was um, acquired in um, in uh, much earlier than 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 today. This is an old uh, paper by Dan Lizaraldi and Steve Holbrook, uh, one of the earliest and one of uh, one of the only acquisition along this portion of the um, of the East Coast. And this shows the uh, the rifted margin with the seaward dipping reflections and the uh, anomaly in the lower crust showing this fast uh, uh, this fast base of the of the crust associated with the seaward dipping reflections suggesting that the sin rift magmatism has a dramatic expression in the crust 
and and we expect possibly a complementary expression in the mantle and obviously this is what we wanted to to look for and so so these are the scientific goals that we were after and this is why we um, we defined a community experiment and also there was you know the other uh, goals of the uh, enum community experiment was to provide uh, an open access data set that will be useful for a variety of science targets. And so this will be available to the community upon acquisition and will allow a number of people uh, to take advantage of the marine and land seismic data and through a, a broad training program. So in the uh, experiment and in the proposal we built a, a very um, uh, elaborate uh, training program both during the cruise and the land acquisition and post uh, field acquisition. And so this was actually the idea to enlarge the base of users both for the marine and the land uh, seismic data. So how did we, uh, how did we build this uh, and implement this, this experiment? So the history of the the um, uh, Enum community experiment started in October 2011 at the um, GeoPRISM uh, implementation um, meeting and um, at Lehigh University where the community experiment idea was actually first suggested and this as I said was um, the meeting where uh, was sponsored by the um, Earthscope and GeoPRISM and this is where the community uh, identifies several corridors along the long, along the enum margins, and um, and this is where the synergy between the USGS, the Earthscope, and all the other uh, opportunities first was yeah. identified. Uh, eventually, uh, this is where Harm and uh, myself were identified as uh, the. Um, uh, volu we we were volunteered, I will say. Uh, to take the lead and um, and seek the um, uh, the community input to further this idea into an implementation plan, and uh, in December 2011, uh, at uh, the full AGU, we um, we started discussing the scope and, and possible scenarios for seismic data acquisition along the along the margins, and uh, eventually we gathered the community. And in the spring of 20, 2012, we, um, using the GeoPRISM website, we, um, we asked the uh, community to uh, define the, um, uh, which area of the enum to select for a, a specific uh, seismic experiment. And in May, we defined uh, through a straw poll, we used to select a target area among the three uh, corridors that were identified initially at the Lehigh. Uh, workshop, and so uh, the community selected the 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 region, the focus site, and in July 2012, the a group of uh, volunteer was identified the proposal to GeoPRISM, and a proposal was submitted um, to the panel. And in April 2013, almost a year later, we uh, got notification of funding uh, recommendation. So we further went back to the community to. Um, uh, get input about what type of experiment design was ideal for the need for the scientific need and based on that we then went into the field and uh, in 2014 and acquired active source data uh, broadband uh, broadband beta, uh, broadband um, uh, OBSs were deployed and um, uh, into 2014 the MCS and the wide angle seismic processing workshop took place the MCS data were released and in 2015 there was another field season the broadband also um, the broadband data uh, where uh, the OBSs were picked up and the uh, land wide angle seismic data were acquired and released to the community so how did we actually implement all this so the enum straw poll as I said uh, uh, ask the community to define which one of the three um, previously identified uh, corridors uh, was the one we needed to focus and most of the votes ended up going through to the Richmond and Charleston uh, corridors so uh, the Lehigh, um, at the Lehigh um, meeting the community identified uh, several corridors 
and the Philadelphia, the Richmond, and the Charleston uh, corridors. During the straw poll a year later, the community wanted, to, wanted us to focus either on the Richmond or on the Charleston corridor. Um, because we uh, couldn't actually focus on both corridors because there was no, um, no, no way we could understand, uh, uh, there was no way we could actually uh, acquire data on, along the two corridors um, uh, by maintaining a, 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 a 3D um, design. And because we wanted to, uh, we need to understand, we wanted to maintain a 3D acquisition so we uh, we couldn't uh, we had to uh, sp we couldn't split the data acquisition between the two corridors, and so we chose to uh, to focus uh, on the Cape Hatteras uh, region, which also um, was a it's also a major lith lithosphere boundary where the um, the East Coast uh, magnetic anomaly meet with the Brunswick magnetic anomaly, and so and also this is a region where the um, the landslide north and south of Cape Hatteras seems to change character. So this seems to be a, an area of uh, a major lithosphere boundary, you know, between uh, these two regions. So we ended up uh, choosing Cape Hatteras as one of the best compromise between the Charleston and the Richmond corridors, and in order to maintain also this 3D uh, complexity and to design a, an acquisition that will straddle both uh, corridors. And so we proposed a layout that, um, and this is actually the proposed layout of the, of the experiment. There is a, a land component and a, a, an offshore component. There are active and passive source um, um, components. The passive source component offshore is an extension of the footprint of the TA uh, on land. And also there are two main um, um, deep profiles that extend from land into offshore and acquire explosion uh, data on land and OBS um, uh, data offshore. And then there are strike profiles that are supposed to capture the along strike variation. And so in, um, in practice, what we proposed was uh, 47 days of OBS and additional MCS shooting using the um, the Marcus Langset uh, vessel for a grand total of about uh, uh, 5,000 kilometers marine seismic reflection data. And we had planned three cruises with a total of 58 days on a separate vessel. We requested the NOR uh, for OBS deployment and recoveries. We requested 40 broadband OBSs on two aerial arrays with different densities for the OBSs, uh, for the broadband OBSs and uh, 60 short period OBSs from the OBS uh, facility uh, to be deployed along six refraction line for a grand total of about 137 drops. On land, we requested about 105 um, uh, RefTech one, uh, 130s um, along the three profiles, augmented by um, RT, uh, uh, RefTech 125s and about um, uh, seven large explosions of 500 to uh, 1,000 uh, kilos each. So this is actually what we uh, proposed, and uh, and you uh, usually never get what you propose. And so this eventually, uh, what is important to capture here is that you see that the sum is usually larger than its part. Obviously, the broadband uh, uh, OBS array were planned to record the OBS and the MCS shots, and so you, you, the, the sum of, of the acquisition was uh, much uh, bigger than, than its singular in it component. So we ended up actually being uh, funded for a smaller amount, and therefore we had to um, um, redesign the acquisition experiment. And uh, so we scale it down to 33 days of OBS and, uh, and less, uh, only uh, 47 um, short period OBSs. And so we lost one line along uh, one of the strike line on land. We shortened the, the two uh, deep lines on land. But um, um, without losing much of the design, we, can, we could still address most of the main questions that we uh, were uh, asked. 
And so we felt that we could lose uh, some of the structure, some of the design online because uh, Earthscope was going to address most of, uh, most of the questions uh, on land. And so we focus mostly on the offshore part. And so eventually this is actually what we ended up acquiring. And uh, so this is the design we ended up acquiring um, uh, off offshore onshore um, uh, profiles along two main deep lines, profile one and profile two to the south. And these profiles uh, uh, cross the um, uh, continental uh, uh, lithosphere across the stretch continental crust Crossed, they, they cross the East Coast magnetic anomaly and they extend into the, um, the uh, new oceanic crust and then into the um, normal oceanic crust and, you know, in, of the Atlantic. And then we ended up acquiring uh, um, profiles that are located along the um, magnetic anomaly, both the East Coast magnetic anomaly and the Blake Spore magnetic anomaly. And what you see here are both the MCS, the multi-channel seismic reflection profile acquired by the Marcus Langset um, vessel, and all these triangles are actually the short period OBSs deployed along them. And on land, we also acquired both um, um, the short period um, stations, the uh, RefTech 130s, and also the uh, ex explosion profiles. And um, so the way we acquired the data, so we, and this is the timeline of the data acquisition, because of some problems with permitting, we had planned to acquire the data in, in one single uh, field season. We ended up having to uh, divide the, the field season in, in two years. So we acquired first the data offshore and the onshore-offshore recording. So this is actually the plan for the summer of, uh, for the fall of uh, 2014. We deployed the OBSs in April 2014 aboard the Endeavour, and their recovery happened just last this May. And then um, we also deployed a broadband off uh, onshore station, these uh, three stations here that were uh, picked up on in May 2015. And then um, we acquired, like I said, the main um, offshore um, acquisition occurred during the September-October 2014. And this consisted in, in uh, shooting uh, multi-channel seismic reflection data along these uh, profiles, both in uh, uh, crustal scale and also high resolution along some of the lines with the 25 meter uh, shooting uh, spacing. And also uh, acquiring a wide angle uh, reflection, uh, refraction data using a short period OBSs along some of the, uh, some of the profiles, which are this, um, uh, triangle uh, stations here. Along this profile, we also recorded the, the shots of the lang set along these two profiles using the um, R uh, 80 RT-130s from the Pascal um, uh, Instrument Center. And so we deployed 40 uh, and 40 along the two profiles. And then we went back the fall, uh, this summer, and then we acquired the uh, explosion experiment on land. And because of a new technique that uh, Steve Harder and the source facility uh, experimented this year, we were able to, uh, instead of using just seven shots, we were able to um, uh, shoot actually 11 uh, shot points along the two profiles. And, uh, and these are the two profiles that were acquired this summer along the two uh, deep lines. And so, so these are actually the... Uh, data spans not just the crustal scales we acquire, not just crustal scale uh, data, but also we acquire high resolution seismic reflection data across some of the um, uh, shallow structures like uh, uh, landslide and salt diapirs. And so this is actually a, a data set that can be used by a variety uh, of scientists for a variety of science application uh, for the community. And so in case you're interested in using this data, which is available to the community, these are the people that were in the field and are responsible for the acquisition of each of these components. So if, in case you're interested in, in a different um, um, piece of this uh, experiment, these are the people that you, are, you should be free to contact in case you want to know more. 
and I'm not going to read them, but um, so let's look at what actually happened in the field. So these are the participants uh, in for the field campaign in 2014. So we involve about 26 scientists and students. These are junior scientists, postdocs, and and uh, and, um, and junior scientists and students that were involved in the acquisition in 2014. These are the uh, the people that deployed the OBSs, uh, uh, and these are the people that were with us in the field for the onshore. Recording and this are, is the group uh, aboard the Langsat, and then and then the participant in 2015. This is just the onshore uh, acquisition, the land shooting. These are um, the land acquisition team, and this doesn't actually show the group from the USGS that uh, uh, got funded to do a piggyback and was able to deploy um, um, 320 uh, RT-125. Uh, in addition to the 400 uh, RT125 that we got uh, funded to deploy, so allowed, allowing us to have a, a station uh, interval of only 250 meters instead of the planned 500 meters. And then this is the shooting team, the land uh, seismic source team. This is the source team that goes and uh, in advance before everybody goes to the field and prepares the, the detonation points and uh, also self-nominated uh, uh, as the inglori inglorious blasters. And this is uh, Dan Lizaralde that is addressing the crew during one of the, uh, one of the briefing meeting. And so there were opportunities for training the students, the uh, junior scientists throughout the entire acquisition. Uh, so this is actually, these are, uh, um, slides from Donna that she provided to me. So they were training and participation in data acquisition processes, processing throughout the entire uh, process. This is obviously two um, uh, students being mesmerized by apparently seismic velocity analysis here. And uh, so there is uh, data uh, analysis and data acquisition training at, at every stage. And then here somebody is enjoying just staring at of the entire um, seismic uh, panels in the on, on the Martus Langset um, uh, main room, and on the Endeavour, this is uh, some of the um, deployment of the OBSs. This is so what they did here. I think this is one of the examples of uh, what you can do if you have a GoPro and you're deploying along the shelf. This is an, an instrument. This is I think is a script. Uh, OBS, short-term OBS, and what they did here, they attached a, gro a GoPro along the um, uh, the OBS, and they what you see here, this is deployed on shallow water, and what you see here, deployment touchdown, as recorded by the uh, GoPro camera, and then the anchor release and the surfacing of the OBS and pickup. So. There were opportunities for learning, not just for the students, but also for the technician. And uh, and then on land, we deployed the station. Again, this is us deploying the last station. Everybody's happy to be done in the field. Training for, uh, we met with a lot of students in the field, uh, sometime with elementary schools. And um, and then these are the RT1, the 80 RT130s that are being um, downloaded. And then on land, you know, broadband stations. These are uh, being the two uh, broadband stations that are being serviced, and these are uh, two earthquakes being recorded. These are the Napa Valley, the magnitude six Napa Valley earthquakes recorded on the broadband station along the coast, and this is the magnitude six point nine uh, uh, Chiapas, um, Mexico, recorded on the Enam stations. And so again, these are just two students that are servicing the, the Brabham station on the other banks. And then, of course, we had the uh, uh, landed, uh, land active source acquisition with the, and these are all the volunteers that do the customary change of batteries on the um, 720 um, Texans. Customary cleaning of the stations at the end of the uh, experiment. And this is some of the uh, drilling and source um, point operations. This is actually one of the two um, um, detonators that go into the um, uh, into the uh, shot points. 
So while each of this, we have two of this, each of this is actually about a uh, hundred pound of emulsion and it's been primed with the detonators which is this um, uh, orange cable that is coming out of the, of the white tube. And so we had 11 of these shock points and all the seismic source um, facility operations went very smooth. We were able to, to shoot successfully all the uh, 11 shock points. And so we had opportunity to do outreach during the acquisition. We did presentation in schools. Uh, we, uh, we have the entire um, um, uh, experiment is uh, on a website maintained uh, by HARM, uh, uh, the UTIG website. And we maintain blogs on both, um, uh, for both acquisitions, both the uh, 2014 and 2015 acquisition, and we had few media interviews. And the data, because this is a seismic community um, acquisition, is available online. It's already been released. All the data products uh, are available for download. You can see this. They are available on the um, Lamont, on the UTIG, and on the Iris DMC um, uh, archives. They can be downloaded. These are the, and the list of data that are available, are downloaded, downloadable right now for you to use and I encourage you to use them. And of course, there were several challenges. This is a, a, a slide that I got from uh, Donna. This is uh, the lung set going through, uh, I think, I believe it's actually one of the regions where uh, the lung set was crossing the Gulf Stream. And this is a deviation. This is the shows the intended profile. This is the intended course that you know, was calculated, and this is actually the deviation due to to avoid uh, some um, uh, fishermen in the area. And uh, usually, what you are expected to have is that the streamer that is your recording equipment is supposed to be uh, behind the boat. You know, in uh, pretty you know, you know, right behind, following you, uh, right behind the boat. Instead, because of the stream, the Gulf Stream. This is the position of the seismic streamer, showing a what we call feathering of about, and I will say, a, a almost 70 degree angle, which is not ideal for uh, a seismic reflection data acquisition. But I'm assuming that they, um, this is this is all they could do, and they kept uh, acquiring data because the, obviously the the uh, Gulf Stream is very strong in this area and there is no other way of acquiring data than just to continue acquiring them. Additional challenges and probably the biggest challenges we had were uh, complicated efforts involving permitting. In This was uh, uh, included some aspect of the permit that had never been, uh, that we had never faced before, mostly combining the, combining the onshore and offshore uh, uh, acquisition and so uh, for us was a very uh, steep learning curve and definitely a learning experience. Okay so let's look at some data before we conclude and so uh, I'm going to show you some of the examples from uh, both the um, reflection data, the OBS data and the land data. So let's start with the uh, marine reflection, multi-channel uh, uh, reflection data. So one of the things that we, um, these are uh, all uh, slides from um, uh, Donna Shillington. So uh, these are, I'm going to show you the profile along the Blakespore magnetic anomaly. The Blakespore magnetic anomaly is a uh, very uh, enigmatic magnetic anomaly uh, located along uh, mature, what we think is mature uh, oceanic crust. And uh, it, it's thought to represent, this magnetic anomaly is uh, supposed to represent a real jump or a change in the direction of the uh, seafloor spreading, but we are not really uh, sure what it really represents. What we, if we, um, this is actually uh, a, the profile line uh, three, so this is actually this line and this is north and south. So what you see here is actually uh, a change, a striking change in, uh, uh, in the character of, you see a reflection in, within the, the, the crust. In, in a long strike uh, structure of the of the of the uh, Blixper magnetic anomaly. What I like to show you is actually the uh, 
the fact that there is a, a pretty thick uh, oceanic crust along this uh, anomaly and that there are structure reflections in the crust and uh, probably this data will need uh, a better uh, processing and more accurate processing to really extract more of the uh, details of the structures in the crust. But what is clear is that this is pretty thick uh, oceanic crust. And so in addition, uh, what I'd like to show you is that these, there is a is dramatic change in the character of the uh, basement, which is, looks pretty rough uh, to the uh, uh, west and pretty smooth to the east. This is now a line uh, at one of the deep lines. And, uh, and this change in the smooth in the character of the basement it seems to occur right at the Blakespur magnetic anomaly. And then as we look you know closer to the uh, to the uh, to the slope, we see that there is um, like I said, very uh, active tectonic to the salt salt um, uh, activity. This is a, a salt diapirs. and so they were able to map slides and, and salt uh, diapirs along the margins and the next slide is one that crosses the Cape Fear slide down to the south and what is clear here, this, high, this is a higher resolution image, this has been shot at about um, 25 meter shot spacing, so a higher, uh, a closer spacing than the other shot, the other lines and what this shows is a complex variation in depth and, and character of the uh, bottom simulating reflectors here so this is also the uh, lower head wall of the Cape Fear uh, slide. What is also clear here, there is some movement. These are, you know, all these waves from uh, embedded in the in the sediment suggest that there is um, uh, some sort subsurface fluid flow in in the region. And uh, so this sediment undulation, you know, in the wave packages, you know, suggests that there is a sediment deformation occurring that might be uh, caused by salt intrusion you know, or other uh, uh, processes. And also there are listric faults you know, coming all the way to the surface from uh, several kilometer deep. So again, although this is a passive margin, there is uh, evidence for um, uh, very active processes you know, occurring along this, along this margin. And then some of the uh, OBS data. This is uh, OBS um, uh, 307, located again along the Blakespur uh, magnetic anomaly. What you see here uh, is the structure. This is uh, data reduced to uh, seven kilometers per second. So, and so data of very high quality. As you see, we see you know arrivals all the way to a, a pretty long, long distances. And then these are two OBSs from uh, two major deep lines. This is one to the south along profile two that shows uh, a pretty dramatic change in structure along this profile. And then this is along, you know, on the uh, oceanic crust. You know, this is OBS along profile one. And then this is the wide angle. This is the data we just pulled out of the, uh, the ground. Um, uh, wide angle seismic data now on land. This is a shot along line one um, along the coast. And what you see here, again, beautiful reflection. These are PMP from the, uh, the Moho under the continent, um, on the North American continent. And what you see, we see arrival all the way from uh, over 170 kilometers offset. And so these are beautiful data, you know, I'm just going to go through, this is now the opposite end of the profile, we are, you know, this is shot point uh, one, and we see again uh, PMP, beautiful PMP, and structures all along the, the uh, crust under the, the Carolina and, and uh, Southern Virginia. With substantial now, we are along, uh, similarly along profile two, PMP, very clear, structures in, in, the, in the crust of, the, uh, of North Carolina. And finally, I think this is my, my last two slides. You know, again, very clear signal. And what you will see here, I wanted to show you this. This is now the, uh, uh, one of the shots along the coast. This is a Camp Lejeune, you know. And uh, what we see, we see structure, all this diffraction actually all this uh, refraction along this uh, this arrivals here show 
probably the edge of the Triassic basins embedded here in the Carolina, uh, along the Carolina um, uh, plains. And so this data is available to you. you I hope that you are going to uh, make good use, use of it and uh, that you're going to get um, a lot of science out of it. And so with this, I'd like to uh, thank you and thank uh, the NSF Geo uh, Prison Program for funding this uh, experiment. Obviously, the captain and all the staff of the crews of the Lancer and the Endeavour. The uh, OBS groups, Scripps and Woods Hall, and uh, um, all the, uh, the Woods Hall, the, the NSF, the North Carolina, and the Lamont Marine Office for uh, the permitting efforts that were enormous yeah, and and very complex. And now, obviously, the people in North Carolina and Virginia that hosted the seismic stations and the, and the USGS Earthquake Hazard Program for funding the piggyback um, group that allowed the deployment of 320 stations along the, uh, the two profiles. And with that, I'll take any questions. Great. Um, thanks so much, Vix, for that uh, wonderful presentation and wonderful introduction to this um, data set that is, yes, freely available to anyone. Um, so if you have any questions um, out there, please feel free to type them in, and I'll wait here for a little bit. Um, don't currently have any. But while um, I'm waiting on that, I was wondering, um, Vix, if you could give some advice to students who might be wanting to work on this data. Are there um, materials that they could access from those workshops um, that they, if they were not able to attend? Uh, I don't think the workshops have been either taped or uh, there is anything available online. But um, if uh, students are interested in working on this, uh, they should contact any of the PIs or their advisor. Again, the data is available. And so there is really no need, there is nothing that they need to do to work on it. The, each data set has been archived with a report, so there is everything, a field report that explains how the data has been acquired and um, in all details. So there is really no uh, barrier that prevents people from using this material. Great. Yeah, thanks. Um, all right, so I don't see any questions. I did just want to point out um, that the um, Pascal Instrument Center also uh, Lots of effort out there, and I know they're out there listening right now. So well done on great job uh, getting those stations out there. And um, thank you very much, Bix. I also wanted to um, change my screen to my own for a second and show you. Uh, let's see, can you see my screen up there, Bix? Yes. Okay. So um, can you see the OBSIP website out there? No? Let's see. <laughs> I knew I'd get something wrong here. All right, so there's the more information on the ENAM um, project that's on the OBSIP website. So if you want to go ahead and go there, you can see that video that was posted on the OBS um, recovery of that um, OBS that had the GoPro attached to it. And um, yep, yeah, just wanted to show that, give a little shout out to Obsit. So, yes, and, oh, sorry, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, and there are, you know, the, the, the two blogs that we maintained have a lot of the information of how the data were collected. So if any, anybody's interested, they can go there and get even more detail on, on a daily basis of how this data were, was collected, so. Great. And they can contact any of the people that were in the field, any of the uh, ENAM, um, uh, ENAM team, the people that I listed, they can go to any of them and, and get any information on or, you know, get them interested in working with them on, on analyzing the data. 
Great, sounds wonderful. All right, thank you very much, Vix, for your great presentation. And as I said, this will be recorded and available online on the IRIS YouTube channel. And thank you very much for everyone who attended. Thank you.